Uh, my name is Dr. Jessica Tretto, um, and I'm going to be talking about inguinal hernias today. Um, hernias is a very broad topic, um, so there's a lot of different types of hernias and a discussion that you can have around each one, but today I'm going to focus on inguinal hernias because it, it is the, you know, one of the most common problems that we see, and um, specifically I'm going to discuss uh, what they are and when to treat them. So first, um, let's discuss a little bit about how common they are. So the lifetime prevalence of an inguinal hernia um, in males is about 27 to 43%. In females, it's about 3 to 6%. So although um, much more common in males, there are plenty of inguinal hernias that are found in females as well. Um, it is the most common surgical condition that's encountered by primary care clinicians. So 1.6 million are diagnosed every year and over 500,000 undergo operative or surgical repair every year. So specifically, what is a hernia? The definition of a hernia is a protrusion or a bulge or a projection of an organ or a part of an organ through the body wall that normally contains it. Um, so the body wall, meaning the abdominal muscles that uh, wrap around uh, the organs. Um, so I always use the ana analogy of a hole in a drywall. So the drywall is going to be your abdominal wall that's holding everything. And then the hole is going to be the hernia defect. Anything that increases the pressure behind that wall is going to cause whatever is in that room to protrude through the path of least resistance, meaning through that hole or through the hernia defect. So the hernia itself is the hole, and then the bulge that you may feel that's popping out of that hole are the contents behind that wall poking through. And specifically, um, common types of uh, groin hernias, inguinal and femoral hernias, we'll discuss in a moment. So why is this important? There are certain risk factors or factors that increase your risk of developing an inguinal hernia um, that you can be aware of. As we discussed, males uh, encounter this more than females. There are certain age ranges that are the peak of incidence or the most common ages where you can find these, but there are, you are definitely uh, plenty of inguinal hernias that are diagnosed between these ages. Um, family history in a first degree of relative has also been associated with developing a hernia uh, in yourself. And there are certain diseases um, that impair collagen metabolism, meaning collagen is uh, dysfunctional because of the disease, and that leads to a weakness in the tissues, and that causes the patient to be more susceptible to developing a hernia. Having a history of a prostatectomy or removal of the prostate, especially if this is done through an open approach, meaning one big incision, rather than a laparoscopic or minimally invasive approach, an open approach has an increased risk of four times to developing an inguinal hernia, and certain conditions that increase intra-abdominal pressure. So diseases that can cause a chronic cough, such as COPD or emphysema, increased pressure, uh, chronic constipation with frequent straining can do the same. Uh, the extra weight from obesity can increase abdominal pressure, and uh, pregnancy, of course, increases intra-abdominal pressure. So where are they found? Uh, like I said, there are many types of hernias that, are, that can occur in the body. Uh, specifically, uh, groin hernias, the main common, the main types um, are these four here. There's inguinal hernias, and uh, within that class, there's indirect and direct, and I'll discuss that in a moment. There are femoral hernias, which are a little bit lower in the groin, and then there's obturator hernias, which you can actually see from the outside. It's more on the inside of the body. And you can see in the bottom picture here, um, on the left, this is a normal groin. Uh, the bowel is inside the abdomen and the testicles and the scrotum. And eventually over time, that hernia in the groin region um, can enlarge and then intestines can then start migrating through that hernia. Um, and that's the bulge that you feel. So as far as inguinal hernias, uh, where uh, specifically are they. Um, with inguinal hernias, there are two main types, the indirect and the direct inguinal hernias. Um, the most common type is the indirect hernia. This is the most common type in males and females out of all the inguinal hernias. Um, and this is found 
through this where the contents or whatever is behind this abdominal wall. This is the right hip you can see here in the skeleton. This is a zoomed in picture of the right side of um, the pelvis or the right groin. And inside the body, there's this canal through the abdominal muscles. The internal ring is the internal opening or the opening on the inside that leads to a canal or a pathway and then an external ring where it leads down into the scrotum or the testicle. Um, and if you have a hernia that goes through this canal, this is an indirect inguinal hernia. And this canal is where you have the spermatic cord or the main uh, structures that lead from the abdomen or um, the belly to the scrotum that houses the main vessels, nerves, and also the vas deferens, this is the tube that carries sperm into the scrotum. And that's where all of that goes through. In females, there's a ligament in this area called the round ligament. And if you have a hernia that goes through this canal, that's the indirect hernia. This can develop uh, more frequently on the right side compared to the left side. For males, the reason for that is because there's a later descent of the right testicle compared to the left. And in females, this is attributed to some asymmetry in the pelvis. For direct hernias, there's a protrusion through this triangle here called the Hesselbeck's triangle. Um, there are certain landmarks or specific structures that cause the borders of this triangle. Um, but this is due to a weakness of the floor of this inguinal canal. So this is where these hernias lie. Most of the time, your uh, surgeon or physician won't be able to tell which one um, you have specifically at the time of diagnosis or when they're doing your exam in the office, um, but we can tell uh, during surgery which one it is. The other two types that we'll discuss um, are femoral and obturator hernias. A femoral hernia um, accounts for less than 10% of all groin hernias or 2-4% to of all groin hernia repairs. Now even though a indirect inguinal hernia is the most common type in females and males. When it comes to femoral hernias, females have a higher tendency to develop these compared to males, 20 to 31% versus 1% in males. Um, it's located a little bit lower in the groin. There's this ligament here called the inguinal ligament, um, and that is kind of the landmark or where we can see above or below that ligament, we can define some of these hernias and the femoral hernias below that ligament. It protrudes through what's called the femoral ring. This femoral ring can widen with aging or following an injury are common reasons, um, and that's why those develop. The obturator hernia is the least common type of these four types. It accounts for less than 0.04% of all hernias. It protrudes through this little uh, foramen or canal or opening in the pelvis. This is the right pelvic bone, um, and there's this canal called the obturator canal where a hernia can develop. Uh, weakness may result in enlargement of the canal, and some risk factors that are associated with this are profound weight loss or spinal deformities, such as um, as you can develop an arthritis or after a fracture. So how do they develop? There's two major pathways uh, in which um, the origin of a hernia uh, can progress. So that's congenital or a result of an abnormal development, either in the womb or after birth. And then there's acquired reasons, and these are due to alterations that lead to weakening or disruption of the tissue. For congenital um, or developmental uh, reasons, this is most commonly due to failure of something called the process, processus vaginalis to close. Processus vaginalis is just the fancy term for an outpouching of what's called the parietal peritoneum. Parietal peritoneum is the innermost layer of your abdominal wall. This picture is just showing how all the different layers of the abdominal wall tend to form this outpouching where the testicle descends from the abdomen into the scrotum um, as you develop as an infant. Um, and this canal or this outpouching called the processus vaginalis um, is intended to close after this occurs. The failure of that closure then leads to this opening that allows a hernia to develop. And in females, this outpouching has an equivalent called the canal of nook. For acquired reasons of developing a hernia, uh, many times this is due to an incision or previous surgery, previous scar tissue, an injury, 
uh, connective tissue disorders like we discussed with the collagen diseases, chronic steroid use, which leads to a weakening of the tissues, um, older age or smoking, as smoking impedes wound healing after you develop uh, a scar or, an, or healing from an incision. And then due to the weakening or disruption of these tissues, this allows any intra-abdominal contents to then protrude through any uh, hernia that may develop in that area. And again, conditions that increase intra-abdominal pressure can increase your risk of developing a hernia through this weakened tissue. So complications, what can go wrong? This is what um, is worrisome about these hernias. This is a question that I get many times when patients ask me, what do I need to worry about now that I know that I have a hernia? And the main uh, complication that's worrisome is incarceration or strangulation. Incarceration is a trapping of the hernia contents uh, within the sac or within the outpouching of where the hernia is located. And if the contents protrude through the hernia and then get stuck or you're unable to reduce them or put them back into the abdomen, um, them being stuck in that hernia defect, then you have a reduced blood flow to the tissue that's protruding through the hole or the hernia. And then that reduced blood flow leads to swelling of the tissue. The swelling of the tissue is a negative um, spiral down to less blood flow, uh, the tissue gets compromised, and then you that leads to strangulation or ischemia necrosis of the hernia contents, meaning now the blood supply is so low that the contents within the hernia are not getting enough oxygen and the cells begin to die. So whatever's going through the hernia defect, whether it's bowel, omentum, could be bladder, could be ovary sometimes, um, that gets compromised. Even though this is the most worrisome complication, the risk of this actually occurring is exceedingly low. It's 0.3 to 3% per year. So that means that over 97% of the time, this process does not happen. Some risk factors for this happening, as we discussed, uh, females are four times more likely to have femoral hernias. So although femoral hernias are the least, uh, are one of the least common type of hernia, less than 10% of all groin hernias, there's actually a 40% risk of presenting as an emergency with incarceration or strangulation with femoral hernias, and females are more likely to have femoral hernias. So that's why generally when we find inguinal hernias in females, or if you're able to tell on exam that it's a femoral hernia with its location being lower in the groin, then the general recommendation is to repair it. Um, also, if you've had a hernia-related hospitalization within the past year, it's recommended that you go ahead and fix the hernia sooner rather than later. And again, hernias tend to enlarge over time. Uh, as the hernia enlarges, this tends to cause more discomfort, more pain if the hernia is left untreated. Um, so that can be a complication of uh, leaving it untreated. So how are they found? Most hernias are found uh, on history and physical exam. So when you go to the physician in their office and they do their exam, uh, that's usually where you'll find it. Um, general, or sometimes patients find it on their own at home. Um, and that's generally uh, a bulge that you feel in the groin. Uh, some patients may or may not have a bulge. Uh, some patients may or may not have discomfort or pain. Um, they may have one of, you know, one or the other, they may have both. Uh, this can be aggravated with anything that increases abdominal pressure, such as heavy lifting, straining, prolonged standing. At the end of the day, as gravity has been weighing on your body, that tends to um, cause more pressure and then have more discomfort. So that's why oftentimes the bulge is more pronounced at the end of the day. Rather than in the morning, you've been laying down all night, um, the hernia has a chance to reduce back into the abdomen, and the bulge might disappear and then reappear later the next day uh, because of this process. Uh, again, you know, alleviated with uh, lying down or cessation of straining, meaning not straining anymore. Um, and then these are the signs and symptoms that you have to monitor that may suggest that you may have an incarcerated or strangulated hernia. So, you may have moderate or severe pain, worsening pain, uh, not getting better, nausea, vomiting, unable to pass gas or have a bowel movement. Those are all signs of obstruction, meaning what's bulging through the hernia defect may be a piece of intestine that now has kinked, like you, um, you know, kink a hose and now things can't move through. 
um, if you have reddened skin over the hernia site or fevers, these are all signs and symptoms that you should present to your nearest emergency room to have it evaluated. And then uh, diagnosis may be more difficult in females or those with obesity sometimes, so your clinician may order additional imaging if they feel that it's indicated. So what else can it be? There are certain conditions that can produce pain or a mass in the groin that can mimic a hernia that's not a hernia that you can be aware of. Uh, there are soft tissue masses that can occur in the groin uh, and large lymph nodes. There's many lymph nodes in the groin that can uh, enlarge for certain conditions or infections. Uh, scrotal mass um, may develop. Round ligament varicosities during pregnancy, these are as you know, pregnant um, patient it has more volume in their veins, those veins tend to dilate and they can form these irregular bulges on the veins and that bulge may be confused with the hernia sometimes. An aneurysm, meaning uh, the artery in the groin for um, certain conditions or diseases can balloon um, and that balloon can then be felt like a bulge and be confused as a hernia. A muscle, muscle strain or tear, also known as a sports hernia, is actually a misnomer because a hernia isn't actually found, but the persistent pain in that uh, side of the groin can lead you to think that there may be a hernia, um, but it's actually just a strain or a tear of the muscle. And then hip problems or lumbar radiculopathy, meaning pain from the nerves that come from the lower back, the pain from those two conditions can radiate to the groin. So sometimes you may be confused of whether there is a hernia there or not that's causing the pain or if it's just the back or hip problems. So if any of these conditions are suspected, then uh, further imaging may be ordered to help distinguish between the two. So when and why are they fixed? There's obviously two main options. Either you wait or you repair it surgically. Uh, the hernia is not going to go away on its own, so the only definitive treatment is surgical repair. The uh, groin hernia repair is one of the most common operations performed, like we discussed, over 500,000 per year in the U.S. and over 20 million per year worldwide. As we discussed with hernias in females and femoral hernias, these are repaired due to the higher risk of incarceration or strangulation. But there's actually no evidence that physical activity will result in worsening of the hernia or incarceration. So many times patients ask me, you know, is there anything I did to make this uh, hernia develop? Or is there anything that I can do moving forward that can make this worse now that I know that I have one? And I generally tell them um, this fact that the data doesn't show that there's anything you can do in particular with your activity that will make it worse or cause it to incarcerate or strangulate. Um, so I generally tell patients that I recommend just continuing your usual regular physical activity or exercise regimen because that's going to be more beneficial to your overall general health to continue doing those activities than to avoid them as there's no evidence to show that it will make a difference if you stop and the risk of incarceration and strangulation, as we discussed, is actually very, very low. So as far as watchful waiting, sometimes this just comes down to patient preference. Um, many patients at the time that they find their hernia um, can't afford to take time off. Um, it's not convenient for their schedule to have it repaired or they just prefer to wait um, and that's okay. Um, this watchful waiting, if you decide to wait, and sometimes patients say it's not convenient right now, but I'd like to get it fixed eventually, if they have other comorbidities or other medical conditions, it allows time to make those better. So if they have high blood pressure, it allows time to get that under control. If their blood sugars are not under control, it allows time for, to optimize that. If weight loss is, um, you know, indicated for their general health, it gives them time to do that. Um, if they're a smoker, smoking impedes wound healing and increases complications with wound healing or infection risk after surgery. So um, it gives them time to potentially attempt to quit smoking as well. Um, so it allows for those other things to make the outcome of the surgery much better for the patient um, also. But during this time, you have to continue to monitor for those warning signs that we discussed. And if they develop, present to the emergency room. 
As far as managing symptoms during this time, there is something called a truss. This is a picture of an example of what that looks like. You can find it at the, um, you know, at your local drugstore. But um, the data shown that this may or may not help, uh, to be honest. But I always tell patients, you know, if it's causing you significant discomfort and it's something that you want to try, um, you know, it's, it, it won't hurt. So you can go ahead and try that to see if it helps you. And then surgical repair is the other option. This is my recommendation. Um, I realize I'm a surgeon and this is what I do, but the reason why I recommend it at your earliest convenience, as we discussed, is because the natural tendency of these hernias, again, is to enlarge over time. As it enlarges, the hernia gets bigger, it gets more complex um, and more difficult to repair, uh, frankly. So I generally recommend to fix them when they're smaller, when the patient's younger, um, it allows for you know a less complex repair, um, less uh, operative time, less time under general anesthesia, and uh, get it fixed now when you're younger and healthier. Whereas later in life, you may develop other comorbidities that can affect the outcome. So how are they fixed? Uh, the current practice right now, there's two general approaches. Um, to hernia repair. The traditional or open approach is when it's repaired from the outside of the body or in front of the hernia. So the top picture here is an example of the incisions you would make for an open approach. The minimally invasive approach, um, either laparoscopic or robotic, um, are smaller, about one centimeter incisions. For laparoscopic, you can see here, there's usually one at the umbilicus or the belly button and two below. For robotic, there's one at the umbilicus and one on either side. You may or may not have an additional incision. Um, and the minimally invasive approach provides uh, numerous benefits over the open approach. It allows for a diagnosis of the contralateral side, meaning if there is a hernia suspected on the other side, the other groin as well, you'll be able to find that during the time of the surgery and potentially repair both at the same time. Uh, even though the long-term outcomes between open and laparoscopic approach are the same, meaning you'll still get a quality repair in the long term either way. Uh, it does, laparoscopic or robotic has a quicker recovery time after surgery and it's associated with less pain after surgery. So that's why generally I only recommend an open repair if there's a contraindica contraindication to doing it minimally invasively meaning the patient can't undergo general anesthesia for whatever reason, which is required for a minimally invasive surgery. So a little bit about the mesh. Um, why is it used? I get many questions about the mesh. You know, you see a lot of commercials about complications with the mesh. And compared with a non-mesh repair, mesh repair it has a lower recurrence rate, meaning a much lower risk of the hernia coming back um, compared to open or compared to uh, non-mesh repair uh, with equal or lower risk of postoperative pain actually. And then the complications of, um, that come from the mesh are actually very rare. It's, an, it's not a common occurrence that you have a complication related to the mesh. Uh, the thing that surgeons need to be cognizant of is placing the mesh um, in the proper position in the groin and making sure it's a sufficient size for that repair. Um, so many times, you know, even if there is a complication with the mesh, although it's uncommon, it's usually not due to the mesh material itself, which is a common selling point for these commercials, but it's actually the way that it was used and where it was placed and the technique that was used to do the repair. And then, of course, there are situations where non-mesh repair is indicated, um, such as in a scenario where you may have an infection or risk of contamination, such as bowel perforation. And then uh, just a little bit about robotics. Um, I am a robotic uh, fellowship trained general surgeon. Um, I did a year of extra training in robotic general surgery. And then the reason why I prefer it is, although there are similar, similar outcomes in the literature compared to laparoscopy and robotics, um, in the end, you will get a quality repair either way. But um, the data suggests there's no difference, but I suspect that um, so that's because the data is actually very uh, young, if you think about it. Robot the robotics platform is much younger than laparoscopy, and the learning curve to, to robotic surgery um, 
requires, um, you know, time for you to develop those skills using robotics. So um, it may just take time for the literature to show that, but the reasons why I prefer it is because compared to laparoscopy, there's much better articulation or rotational movement of the instruments. You can see uh, an example here on the top of a uh, da Vinci robotic system. You have the patient here on the table near the blue drape, and then you have the robot connected to the instruments, and then the surgeon is sitting at this console controlling the instruments right next to the patient. This bottom picture on the left shows a zoomed in picture of what the surgeon sees. So through these lenses, you can see the instruments inside the body doing you know, uh, the instruments that are used during the surgery. And then the uh, surgeon is controlling those instruments from the console with uh, his or her hands. And then you can see on the bottom right, the natural uh, 360 rotational movement that you get in your wrist is actually mimicked by the end of the instrument and it can do um, you know, 360 rotational movement that allows for a much more precise um, operation and when you're manipulating the tissues. Um, and then you have uh, the 3D HD visualization that you get in robotic surgery that is much more advanced in laparoscopy. So that is, those are the reasons why I prefer it and why I do uh, robotic surgery. So with that, that comes to the end of my talk. Um, that was just a little bit about inguinal hernia specifically, uh, how they develop, uh, why it's important to diagnose them, and how we can treat them. Um, so with that, um, I'll close and I'll transition to any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Cueto. Um, there are a couple of questions that came through the Q&A. Um, one question is, if the hernia does not hurt, can you leave it alone? Uh, certainly, um, as we discussed, there is that option of watchful waiting. Um, again, you know, if it's not hurting you, it's not bothering you, then you can just monitor for those concerning symptoms. Um, but over time, it will likely enlarge. Um, so whenever it's at your earliest convenience, um, I recommend fixing it before it gets very large and complex to repair. But I leave it up to the patient. If it's not something they're interested in, then it's definitely reasonable to wait. And then I see here, can pregnancy result in the reemergence of a corrected hernia? Um, you know, it's always possible, um, but the reason why we repair the hernia, especially with mesh, um, is to reduce that, that risk of the hernia coming back. Um, so likely if you had a quality repair, the risk of it uh, reoccurring is, is low. And then I have here, how is the robotics machinery maintained, sterilized storage to prevent infection, et cetera? It's just like any other instrument. So the actual robot arms um, are actually covered with a sterile uh, dressing or plastic. So during the surgery, we're not ever touching the actual robot because it's covered with that sterile dressing, just like we put sterile sheets or dressing on everything we use and on the patient. Um, so once you take off those dressings, the actual robot was never touched. And then the instruments that we do use during the surgery get sterilized uh, with the same process that um, any other surgical instrument goes through. And then uh, what percentage of hernias return? You know, it's been quoted anywhere from, you know, 1 to 15 percent, depending on the technique. Um, so that varies based on what type of uh, hernia you you have, what type of uh, repair that you um, use to fix the hernia and whether you use mesh or not, but mesh uh, placement is definitely um, been shown to significantly reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, how about um, the benefits of robotic surgery post-op? Um, so the benefits post-op you know, obviously um, I'm biased and the liter literature hasn't shown this yet, but like the, for the reasons that I discussed, I think that it's a much more uh, precise repair. Um, I'm able to do a much more precise, um, you know, surgery manipulation of the tissue is um, because of that precise motion, I don't have to be as aggressive with the tissue. And I believe that it, it allows for less trauma to the tissue. Um, you know, after surgery. Um, but I do other things that um, help with postoperative pain as well that aren't necessarily 
uh, related to the robot, such as using um, local medication during the operation in the muscles to help with the pain so that the patient doesn't have to use um, as many narcotics post-op, so that helps with the pain. Um, but I think the less manipulation, less trauma to the tissues is definitely beneficial to healing after surgery. And then I have here, how does age affect the decision to do repair versus watchful waiting? If it hasn't enlarged in over three years, it remains small. I'm 82, no comorbidities, it's got very controlled hypertension. So this is a perfect example of, um, you know, a situation where you can wait if it's a small hernia, it's not causing you any discomfort and hasn't enlarged over three years. Um, you know, the risk of you having a complication from this um, is, is really low. So it's definitely reasonable to just wait um, and then you won't have to undergo the risks of surgery. But again, monitor um, those uh, symptoms so that you know when something's wrong. If you've already had a C-section, does that impact surgery or outcome? Not necessarily. You may have a little bit of scar tissue, um, you know, in, in the pelvis, but that doesn't really um, increase much risk per se. Um, it may make the surgery a little bit longer if those uh, adhesions have to be lysed for whatever reason, but um, it shouldn't affect your, your outcome. And then recovery time after surgery. Um, so every patient's different. I always tell patients, um, you know, it's patient specific, but generally after about a week or two, you're back to doing your normal activities at home. I always uh, recommend a restriction of heavy lifting, um, more than about 10 to 15 pounds for about four to six weeks after surgery to allow the, the tissues to repair properly um, and heal well. But usually I tell patients after two weeks, you can go back to aerobic exercise like cycling, swimming, jogging, things like that. Um, and so the recovery time, you know, especially with the minimally invasive approach is, is um, about a week or two. What are the limitations during post-op period? So I discussed this briefly just now. Uh, my main thing is the heavy lifting, no heavy lifting for six weeks. Um, aerobic activity after two weeks. But other than that, I want you to be up and walking the day of, you know, the night of surgery. Uh, walking has actually actually been shown in the literature to enhance recovery. Um, so walk as much as you can, as much as uh, your body allows. Um, and then just, you know, if you're having more discomfort or pain, slow down, but walking is good. I have diaphragmatic hernia without obstruction or gangrene. Do you have some, any suggestions as to what to watch for diet or activity advice? Um, so I would definitely um, monitor that um, as far as the diaphragmatic hernia, there's different types. So there are diaphragmatic hernias, meaning there's a hole in the actual diaphragm or the breathing muscle. And then sometimes diaphragmatic hernias can be confused with what's called a hiatal hernia, which is where the stomach starts migrating into the chest. Um, with diaphragmatic hernias, that's something that a thoracic surgeon uh, would monitor for to make sure that there's no complications for that. So I would have an evaluation if you have that. Um, but if you have a hiatal hernia, um, uh, there are, you know, I would recommend getting an evaluation um, if it's causing you any symptoms to see if it's symptoms from the actual hernia versus another GI uh, process, because there's a workup that needs to be done to figure out if there's other ways, other medications that you can take to help with the symptoms that you may be experiencing. Um, hiatal hernias are similar in that they just tend to get bigger over time. So I would just continually monitor with your physician or if you've seen a GI doctor or surgeon that if your symptoms um, progress or get worse or you feel like, you know, it's to the point where it's now large enough where it's not allowing you to eat and things like that, then a repair is definitely um, indicated and recommended. How long is the procedure typically? Uh, for inguinal hernias, usually it takes about an hour and a half, two hours if it's a large one. Um, that's usually the operative time. It is an outpatient procedure. You go home the same day. Um, it's under general anesthesia if it's minimally invasive. Um, uh, yeah, it is outpatient. 
how would I know if the hernia is obstructed? So it is those uh, those signs and symptoms, those warning signs and symptoms that we discussed. Um, if it's obstructed or it's stuck, um, then you would have increasing and worsening pain. You may have nausea, vomiting, unable to pass any gas or stool, um, meaning the intestine could be obstructed within the hernia. Um, you know, really red, painful, bulge, fevers, those are all signs um, that you could have an obstruction or incarceration and you should present to the, your local emergency department. I think that's all the questions. Does anybody have any additional questions while we have Dr. Credo? Okay. Um, do you want to put your uh, contact number in the chat so that people can reach out to you? Oh, yes. Somebody else, another question. So I'll do that while you answer this question. <laughs> okay. After my surgery, the surgeon recommended in the future avoiding any heavy lifting as well as sit ups on exercises that are near the site. Yes, and immediately postoperatively, that's also my recommendation. No heavy lifting for four to six weeks, and then um, you know, sit-ups are going to increase your abdominal pressure and put pressure on the on the repair. So I'd also wait on that as well. But as far as aerobic activity, that's you know, jogging, cycling. Um, I generally recommend that you can you know progressively increase that again after two weeks. Where can I see the recording? Uh, where can I see the recording of this meeting? I'll, I'll leave that to Kaylin <laughs> to um, give the details on that. Uh, Kaylin, if you could tell everyone where to find the recording of this meeting. Thank you. Um, yes, we are going to email it out to everyone who registered for this. So you will uh, receive it via email and it will also live on YouTube. And then what is the reoccurrence rate of a hernia? Um, as I said, they, it's been quoted anywhere between 1 and 15 percent, but that, um, that is dependent on the type of repair that's used and whether mesh is used. Um, and again, you know, mesh repair decreases the risk of occurrence. And then does diastasis recti impact surgery too? So diastasis recti um, is not a hernia, it's a widening of the rectus muscles or the, the ab muscles, the muscles that run up and down the center of the abdomen. When those muscles widen, there's still tissue in between those muscles. And um, so there's no actual hole, but that tissue tends to bulge with any pressure that's inside the abdomen. So that bulging when it is visible to the patient when they're, you know, especially doing crunches or, or sitting sitting up from lying down. So that bulge looks like a hernia, but it's just the tissue bulging out because now it's not behind muscle because the muscles have separated. Um, so that's related more to uh, ventral or abdominal wall hernias, uh, whether that is um, repaired or not. That If you just have diastasis recti, that's a cosmetic procedure. Um, but if a patient has a hernia as well, I, uh, when I do the hernia repair, uh, if they have abdominal wall hernia, um, when I do the repair of the abdominal wall hernia, um, if it's indicated, um, there are instances where I will try and reapproximate the muscles or bring them closer back together if I think it'll augment the hernia repair. 